afternoon's lunch and learn. Welcome to everyone who's live also on Facebook and YouTube. First time we've done a lunch and learn live on Facebook, Facebook and YouTube uh, at the same time. And also welcome to the Zoomers. For those of you who are new to these lunch and learns, I'm Gray Cause. I'm the founder of a company called Adventures in Move Movement. And I set up these lunch and learns about a year ago when we first went into lockdown. And I thought, oh, this is great. We're going to have a couple of weeks to fill a Friday afternoon. And um, here we are a year later. Uh, so, yes, so we're still doing these. Lots of good content, lots of good feedback. And that's the reason why I'm continuing to do these, because we've been joined by some brilliant people and getting lots of different insights into breath work, into movement. And that's the idea of, of what we're, we're looking at. Today, I'm joined by a friend and colleague, Mike Mayer, who is an an advantage instructor. He's also um, a brilliant YouTuber. He's got like 75, over 75,000 YouTube subscribers and followers. And he has this fantastic YouTube channel called Take a Deep Breath, which uh, has got lots and lots of brilliant content on there. So I definitely advise you to go straight after this and look at its content. He has worked with some of the uh, best top breath workers in the country. He's, he's interviewed some of the breath top workers, breath workers in the world. Uh, and yeah, so the idea is this is going to be more like a conversation rather than a presentation from Mike. So do feel free to drop any comments in the chat box. If you're on Facebook and YouTube, if you're on Zoom, just drop the comments into the chat on Zoom as well. So I'd like to introduce you to Mike. The first question I've most probably got for you, Mike, is how did you become such a successful YouTuber, sir? Welcome, Mike. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a real privilege to be um, on your uh, podcast, Lunch and Learn, Gray. Um, and I'll admit straight away, I'm not used to being interviewed because I'm the one that does the interviewing. So uh, mild discomfort here, but uh, I'm, I'm jumping straight in. But uh, no, lovely to, to be with everybody this uh, this Friday afternoon. Um, and I hope you're all breathing well. And <laughs> if not, maybe we can give you some tips and tricks for that today as well. So yeah, so, so thank you for that, that lovely introduction. Um, I guess in short, I never planned on getting into YouTube, although that's not true. I wanted to be a travel vlogger. I was obsessed with travel vlogging and I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to get paid to go around the world with a camera and, you know, talk about all the wonderful locations. And um, I digress slightly, but I did go for a year of travel in 2019 um, and I tried to do it and it was such a pain in the bum because you can either be travel vlogging or you can be enjoying your travels. And I, I couldn't do both. And I also felt very conscious walking through airports and uh, beaches, you know, vlogging. So uh, so that was a bit of a failed career, but I definitely learned a few things from that. But um, yeah, so, so with YouTube, I, it's a funny one because um, I'm sure we'll get stuck into some of this, but uh, I did a retreat with a chap called Wim Hof, a Dutch athlete, but which I'm sure a lot of people watching today probably know who he is. Um, and then I wanted to practice some of the some of the breath work that I'd, I'd learned, you know, much, much after we'd, we'd left the retreat in Poland. And there really wasn't much online. So I made my own versions of that. Um, and yeah, that was the, the real start of the, the YouTube journey. And then you know, fast forward three, four years later, here we are now with a, a community of over 77,000 active subscribers, uh, 10 million views or something like that we've had since we went live on the channel. Um, and it's it, it continues to grow, which I love because it's, it's less about me and take a deep breath and more about people's thirst for breath work, if that's the right way of putting it. People really get an interest in breath work a bit probably like they were 20, 30 years ago with yoga. I feel like we're on the cusp of, of something wonderful here. So I'm very much a just a bit of a conduit of taking breathing exercises that I practice and use and going, right, I love that. Let's let's get that shared and uh, and get that on and let other people benefit from some of that as well. I've got a bit of a, a background in video production. So I don't know how much of this I've shared with you, Gray, but um, my university degree was at Stafford and uh, that was in film production and uh, never got to use that for 15 years other than I started filming weddings so in my spare time I filmed something like 
50 different weddings. I've seen all sorts of weddings from all sorts of backgrounds. And I used to be able to recite what the, the vicar was going to say in the Church of England once. Um, so that was uh, that, that. And I was married myself. So uh, that and we'll probably get stuck into a little bit of that today. But uh, so, so, no, I had the video production equipment. I knew how to edit. And um, I forget who I was watching now. I think it was Tim Ferriss saying, get a couple of skills, a couple of different skills and put them together. And when you combine all those different skills, um, that's where you can get some, some real value. So for me, I think there was this thirst for breath work and health and wellness, but then this ability to know how to edit video, animation, audio, all that sort of stuff and being able to combine those two things together. Whereas I'm sure there's a lot of fantastic breathwork people out there that probably just have very little interest in, in video editing and that sort of thing. And, and vice versa, we've got loads of video editors out there, but they probably don't have a niche that they're obsessed about or love and they, they want to get into. So, so that's, that's a very, very brief overview. I'm, 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 I can very easily yabber on gray. So uh, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a, a short version of how I got into what we're into now. As I say, this is much more a conversation than a presentation. So yabber on as much as you like. This is what we want to hear. <laughs> you mentioned a gentleman called Wim Hof. Wim Hof is ob often the person who draws people into breathwork to start off with because obviously he's got a very good marketing tool and a great technique out yeah. there. So how, what sort of like attracted you to Wim Hof? Because I know you work and, and do still work in the corporate environment. So very much not in a fitness environment, I'm presuming where you're, where, you, where you're working. So there must have been something that drew you to the to the hoffers out there. So be, how, how did you come about with, with that? Yeah, no, I, it was, um, so it was, a, it was 2016 and um, I'd just gone through, a, going through a divorce, you know, going through an end of a, a, a big relationship. And um, I was listening to a lot of Joe Rogan. He filled a lot of my spare time. You know, uh, he was a, that friend in your ear that you're listening to. Have I frozen, by the way? I think my screen might have frozen. Oh, no, I'm back again. No, you're back. I'm back. Um, so, yeah, so, so listen to a lot of Joe Rogan and uh, just just listen to all these different wonderful people and, and starting to believe that there's all this, I, I call it magic. I don't know what another word is for it. There's all these people out there with all these different skills. And when you work a corporate job and you just do the same stuff day in, day out. There's not a lot of room for magic in your life for all these different things that people consider a bit weird, a bit crazy. Um, you know, you go home, you watch a bit of TV and you live your life. And before you know it, two, three, four decades have passed. Um, so anyway, I was at this point in my life where we'd sold a house, had a little bit of money in savings. So I had a lot of free time and I was listening to a lot of Joe Rogan and this name kept coming up, Wim Hof, Wim Hof. And um, I actually hadn't listened to the Wim Hof episode but I just kept him talk about this, this, this guy. And I was like, okay. So I eventually sat down and watched it and it, it just blew me away. And then I watched the, the Vice documentary afterwards, which is free on YouTube. And it's about a 40 minute uh, expose of Wim. Um, and you see him at his house in Poland and, and all that sort of stuff. And I don't know, I just felt I have to go there. I have to go. Um, is it possible to go there? So, you know, a bit of quick Googling. There was a couple of spaces left on a course. This was probably maybe September, October. Um, and it was the end of November that I was in Poland with 60 other people um, meeting Wim Hof. Um, the other thing as well that drew me to it was um, I had and have probably not as much now, but have a fear of the cold. Um, and it sounds ridiculous now as somebody that's swam in, you know, frozen lakes and, and all that sort of stuff. But um, I remember very, very distinctively, we would go to Gran Canaria a couple of times when I was a kid. Um, and they had two pools, they had like a chlorine pool and they had a salt pool. And the salt pool was cool because you could float easy and I'm not a very good swimmer. So I was like, oh, okay, I really want to go in the salt pool. But the salt pool wasn't heated. Um, so it was really, really chilly. And I would try my best to get in that pool with my dad and I would jump in and I would immediately jump back out again. And that cemented something in my mind as a bit of a fixed mindset to go, you can't handle the cold. Some people can, you can't. So I'd grown up with that fixed mindset from the age of, I don't know, 12, thinking I can't handle the cold. So when there's a, a famous person on a, on the Joe Rogan podcast, you know, a guy that I really, really respect and listen to hundreds of hours of his content, talking about how he can help anybody master the cold and, and all these different things, um, I thought, I, I just need to have a go at that. Maybe I can be a guy that can handle the cold. Um, and so that drew me to him. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, fast forward to, to the end of November 2016. Uh, there I am um, waiting in the Prague 
airport because we had to meet in Prague and then get a bus back into Poland. So I was already in Poland, we went to Prague and then we got a big minibus back, all, all sort of 60 of us. And uh, yeah, I'm waiting there by myself and all these other people are by themselves and we kind of, you know, meet each other and shake hands and people from all over the world. And how did you hear about, uh, how did you hear about Wim Hof? Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan. Yeah, most people, I think he was, uh, if he, he should have got an affiliate link for uh, promoting Wim, I think. <laughs> um, so, so we all got on the, the coach and we traveled two or three hours and, um, a story I don't tell that often, actually, is I met my best friend on that bus now as well. So, so a guy called Lester, um, who we, we run a hypnotherapy channel together on YouTube as well. Um, he, uh, me and him sat on the bus and just could not stop talking for like the two or three hours it took to get to, to the retreat. Um, and we, you know, we've spent almost every day talking ever since. That was a wonderful thing that came out of it. O almost, if not, I would say more wonderful than learning breath work was having that, that fun, you know, that, that wonderful relationship. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, got there, got to meet Wim. He came in on the first night. And I think the thing that blew me away was he was so accessible. Um, so 60 people sounds like a lot, but when it's a big, big old room and you're in tables, um, he's just there. I had breakfast with him twice or three times, dinner with him at least once, where you're on these rows of tables and you're just sitting opposite him. And some people probably felt like they couldn't ask him questions or they felt maybe a bit shy and I just took advantage of it. And, you know, we had, we had some lovely conversations, um, as did many other people that I, I sat with. Um, and yeah, we'd go out and we'd go into his house, which is down the road, his Polish house, and we'd use his sauna and go into his ice bath. Um, and so, yeah, over that six or five or six days spent quite a lot of time talking with Wim and, and his team of people. Um, but yeah, that, that, that was my, my, my story of getting into it. Yeah. So, so the podcast, this feeling of, lack or emptiness and then from there um getting stuck into to spending a week with this guy and, and and these wonderful wonderful people that's fantastic it sounds as if there's a few things you took away well a lot of that you took away from that but you mentioned their community which i think is an important part of when we're thinking of breath work because uh you you want to be working with people and i know perhaps particularly with like the Wim Hof guys, is that that whole sense of community and that experience that you have with the group. What would you say, Mike, was most probably the big, biggest takeaway from, from that experience with, with the Wim Hof, that first experience with Wim Hof? Do you mean the retreat itself? Yeah. Or do you mean, um, okay, oof, oof. Can Let's I give you a couple? Give, give us a couple. <laughs> okay, so, um, so number one, is how adaptable our body is and can be and um that first proper night so the first night we traveled there so fast forward to the first day that night um we all went to wim's house sort of 20 of us we're in three groups of 20 and um it was time to use the ice baths we'd, we'd done a bit of trekking in the day in our shorts and you know barefoot but this was the first night we got into freezing cold water and i remember the ice was frozen on top of this outdoor brick bath and somebody had to kind of take all the ice off. And I was like, right, I'm going to be the first one in that bath. Cause if I don't do this, I might end up quitting. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I got in, I sat in and I braced and I braced and I braced and I braced. And the guy that one of the coaches is standing there with a big fluffy coat on scarf gloves. And he's going, relax, relax. And I'm like, it's easy for you to say you're not in the water. <laughs> and, and so I, I, I was in fight or flight. I know that now I wasn't breathing properly. I tensed up my entire body and I ran out and I sat in the sauna and there was a big old sauna and all the other people, they kept going in, going back to the sauna, going in, going back to the sauna. Wim would come in with his towel and there's one of those hot coals. He was spinning his towel around to get the heat into the, into the sauna. Um, and I, I, I just sat there completely depressed. Compl I don't think I've told this, completely depressed. And I was like, I've messed up here. I'm going to go home tomorrow. There's no way I can go back into, into that bath again. It's, it's completely impossible. It's too cold. It's too painful. And, you know, the people around me, oh, this is my fourth time, my fifth time, my sixth time. And I just sat there in silence, not talking. Everyone was having really good banter. And I don't know what happened in me. I, there was just this moment going, go and do it one more time. And if it's horrible, then then go. But at least do it one more time because you're already here now. So, And this was probably 20 minutes into me sitting in the, in the sauna. So I got back up, went back in again. And as the guy was saying to me, relax, breathe, let go, I just, I just stopped tensing. The shoulders came down. I was breathing. And I just relaxed and something just happened. And, and the only way I could describe it now, as ridiculous as that sounds, it was like getting into a warm bath, a hot bath. I just settled in 
and I relaxed and just something, just something clicked. And I was like, okay. And it, I, I can't remember how long went by, maybe a couple of minutes. I don't think it was as many as five, but it was a couple of minutes. And I was like, okay, I'm doing this now. Wow. Went back into the sauna, felt like a superhero, warmed back up again, went in the third or fourth. I don't think I went in the fifth time, but did I think four. And, and suddenly just this, this cloud lifted. And um, it reminds me of, there's, there's a little documentary I saw a clip of on YouTube where, um, you know, the springboards that are very, very high on top of um, athletic uh, swimming pools. Yeah, yeah. They put cameras up there and they got members of the public to go up and get ready to jump off. And some would jump off and some wouldn't and some would get scared and come back down again. And it was this thing around the barrier or the perceived barrier of fear. So uh, what that means to me is, um, you know, what, what uh, it's so cheesy, but what have you got to fear other than fear itself? And I think there's a lot of things to still fear. You know, I, I take that quote with a big pinch of salt, but um, often I think we get in our own way when we're trying to do something or we want to achieve something. And, you know, we've all heard stuff about the comfort zone. But for me, um, the minute that I let go of that comfort and was prepared to accept discomfort, everything changed for me. So then you, you fast forward a year later, I'm abseiling off a hospital roof for charity. Um, you fast forward another year later, I've quit my job and I'm traveling around the world with, with no income, you know, and I'm mid, mid thirties. Um, and, and during that travel, I, I don't know if it's called tombstone, but I jumped off a 15 meter cliff into deep water. I would never, I know I would <laughs> never have done that had I never got in that cold bath a second time because it just unlocks something for me. And it's not about being a reckless risk taker, but it's about um, making a sensible decision, but not letting the perception of fear stop you from achieving the things that you want to achieve. So that was the, probably one of the biggest things. Uh, and that also comes to today, you know, being on a live um, stream with you, doing a podcast, thinking, oh, my God, I could never talk to a, a camera and do all these different things. People are going to, you know, leave all sorts of comments and you just accept whatever's going to happen and do it for the right reasons. Um, but for me, it all comes back to that was probably the biggest uh, game changer for me was this this fear door that I went through on that first night. And, and then kind of the rest has, has brought me through to here. So that was the, the the biggest one. And then just very briefly, the second biggest takeaway I got from that um, was the breath work. And in particular, when we did a, an hour, hour and a half breathing session and, um, you know, fully in, let go, fully in, let go, uh, with the breath holds. Um, and I, re I, I in experienced one of the biggest emotional releases ever. Um, and I don't know if that's something to do with being British and, um, <laughs> you know, the stiff upper lip and us not wanting to reveal our, our feelings, but they created a very safe environment. If you think, if we, you know, we talk about um, uh, the tribe or whatever you want to call it, the, the, the community that was created there, um, it was okay to cry. It was okay to laugh. It was okay to cuddle. This is pre-COVID. Um, and um, Wim, I think himself said, it's going to be like a toilet in here. There's going to be a lot of poop coming out today. <laughs> and, and he was right. He was right. Um, this, this, this version of tumo, holotropic breathing, whatever you want to call it, biodynamic breath work, it, it releases some serious emotions. Um, and we had all sorts of emotions. We had one person that went to the toilet in the pants. You have to be aware of that. That sort of stuff can happen. Um, we had people that were in big, big tears. I was in tears, but I wasn't sad. It was a really strange experience I had on the first couple of days. Um, and you know, uh, joyous laughter. And I just remember at the end of one of these big breathwork sessions, we just all came together and had this, just, you know, everyone was cuddling everybody else. And it's, it's one of those things you see on a, a movie and you think I'll, I'll never be part of that, you know, but then it's, again, I'd just been through one of those ice bath fear door moments. So the, the, the the, the thought of cuddling a stranger or the thought of, you know, dancing in the morning to ice ice baby, which is what they play every morning. Um, you know, th those sort of things get dialed down a little bit, those fears, once you've done something like a, an ice bath or whatever it is. So yeah, so they would be my big takeaways would be the emotional release that you can get from breath work. Um, and the, the perception of fear door that I think we all have to go through at some point in our life. Oh, that's excellent. I think one of the biggest things you've said there to me rings true in terms of when you said do it for the right reason, because I think that's why 
your your channel is so successful because you're doing you, you there's a real passion and i think you are you admit you're a self-obsessed breath worker but you're doing it all for the right reason and i think that's why people tune into you and follow you mm -hmm. because it's authentic and i I, re I really feel that and i think that's really important from for any coach to, to be authentic about what what you're delivering so you're not forcing yeah your YouTube channel on anybody. You're actually giving away a lot of great, it's all free content, um, which is fantastic. You've worked with some of the, or you've, you've, you've interviewed some of the top um, breath workers. And a little later on, as we're going through this session, I, I'm gonna ask you if you wouldn't mind just doing a couple of breath practices with us because you're also a trained oxygen advantage instructor, Bateco instructor. Mm -hmm. but. Who would you say, I'm not going to ask you who is your favorite because that's totally unfair. Who is the best person you interview? <laughs> but just some of the key points. So people like James Nestor, when you've spoken to James Nestor, yes. to Patrick, Patrick McEwen. What were sort of like the things when you've chatted to those type of people that has really resonated yes. with you? Okay, I was prepared for this. I've come up with a couple of points. Uh, so hopefully I can do this a bit of justice. And it's difficult as well because I've, um, I think I've interviewed sort of 20, 20 people now, 22, or maybe even more. They're not all gone live, maybe 25 people. Um, so it's still, you know, relatively new podcast, but um, that's 25 hours worth of discussion. Um, just interestingly, somebody put a comment on my channel um, yesterday um, just saying, you know, thank you so much um, for, the, for, the, for the breath cast, which is what we call the, the breathing podcast. Um, it's it, you, it's something like you're really fresh and it's like you're learning with us and we love that because it's you know so refreshing and i was like i am learning with you you know these are the top top experts in the world i don't know this stuff i'm learning it with you yes i get some time before and some time after um but as i've said many times i, I really really try and adopt the white belt mentality i do not want to come out and go i know everything about breath work because i don't think anybody does and i think anybody that's saying that sort of stuff you've got to be really really careful about and i still think it's an emerging field as well um which to me is super exciting but then at the same time we know some some foundation stuff which is good so so okay so let me take you through a couple of uh, a couple of things then so belissa dr belissa Veranich uh, was was uh, one of my earlier guests um and, and by the way what i will say i am pleasantly pleasantly surprised how accessible all these people are i've had patrick on twice now patrick McEwen, author of the oxygen Vantage. obviously gray you've done a couple now um uh, james nest has done two with me we haven't released the second one yet um and james nest has you know he's been on joe rogan and, and all these big ones so um so belissa veranich dr belissa veranich um she runs the breathingclass.com and she's just wonderful. She does a lot of work with um, armed forces and I think with the military um, and uh, UFC fighters. Um, and, and she's very, very much, I think, about functional breathing, but with the belly and the diaphragm. Um, and and she, she coined the term, I think, gut sucker. And I've never heard that before. Uh, and I think we talked about this actually when we went live. And um, I, I, it's, it's this thing around we, we live in a society where children imitate their parents and they imitate what they watch on TV and they imitate the Barbie dolls. And we're meant to have these very, very tight stomachs that don't ever, you know, flop out. Um, and how dare I reveal my tummy? So, so even today I'm, I'm still doing it. I'm still kind of sucking it in. I have to remind myself to consciously let go because for the last 35 years, I've been a, a gut sucker, 37 years, 38 years. Um, so that for me was a big, big one is this thing around let your stomach out and start to breathe properly uh, and it's really hard to do because we meant to be like this you know uh, but but we're not functionally breathing the diaphragm can't move properly if we're not doing this um and she does a she's got a, on her website actually called i think it's called a breathing iq that anybody can take for free um and and you get a tape measure i believe you measure kind of um how much the ribs kind of move out um and with some some different stretching exercises, you can kind of get your um, your ribs, your intercostal muscles to start to move a bit better. You can get the kind of whole chest area to kind of open up a little bit more and you can get to use your diaphragm more practice. So so with Belissa, that was a real gift because um, after we'd finished recording, this is some of the benefits of talking to these people. She's like, right, hang on, we need to do some work. And so it, it was the hottest day of the year in England last year. And I was in this tiny, tiny room sweating in a white shirt, the worst shirt you can wear. Um, talking to this expert and, and luckily she's like, oh, I, you know, I'm a big sweater myself. So I think she's trying to put me at ease, but we we're doing all these different exercises where we were kind of opening up the, you know, the ribs and we did a lot of twists um, and she made me do both sides and she's like, right, go away and practice some of that work. And, and 
I do that on a quite regular basis now, and I can see that there's definitely something going on there. But for me, there's still something around um, the mind, and I need to suck my gut in. And, um, you know, of course, weight loss helps, you know, because you feel less uh, conscious maybe. But even, you know, still got a belly. I just need to keep focusing on just letting that belly go and just trying to breathe using the, the diaphragm. So that was a huge, huge takeaway um, from Belissa. Um, I interviewed a guy called Chris Lemons, who has a Netflix documentary called Last Breath, which made me nearly cry my eyes out. Um, he survived on the bottom of the ocean floor of the North Sea for nearly 40 minutes with no air. So I had to talk to this guy about what the hell was going on. And, and the short story is we, di we didn't really figure it out other than um, maybe his, well, his concentration of oxygen when you're that low down is slightly higher or a lot higher, but also it was very cold down there. So they, you know, after about 38, 40 minutes, they, they got this guy back into the, the submarine, if you want to call it that, and they resuscitated him and he's got no brain damage. And it's, you know, 38, 40 minutes, he essentially died um, on the bottom of the floor. So, so I don't know, that just showed me again, the power of the human body and, and the fact that we don't, we don't know what's going on sometimes. And, and that's really exciting to me again, you know, not if we live in the world, in a world where we knew all the answers, that's really boring. And the mm. fact that we still don't know so many things is, is really good. Um, James Nestor then. So, so, so James was my first uh, interview and there's a recommendation from Patrick actually. So I was going through the oxygen advantage at the right time um, and Patrick was holding up this, this manuscript in, in one of the Zoom sessions. He's like, this is the best book I've ever read on breath. And I was like, oh my God. Um, and uh, I don't know what in, in me inspired me to reach out to, to, to James and say, would you be interested in doing an interview? And he said, yeah. And, and we got the interview set up within, I think within a week, we'd had that podcast. And then a week later, we went on Joe Rogan. And so my one just caught the the wind and the traffic of, of, of all of that. And that's had a ridiculous amount, like 130,000 views or something. Um, I wish I'd known that before and had a haircut and <laughs> set the light up properly and bought a blinking microphone because I was using these Bluetooth awful speakers. So I've had so many comments going, sort your audio out, mate. I was like, I know, I know. Sort your audio <laughs> out. So, that, so there you go. That's, that's, that's part of the journey, I guess. Um, okay. So with, with James, um, it, there's a couple of bits there. One is, isn't it amazing how quickly you can become an expert? So I think what, two years of, of research, and he's probably considered one of the top breathing experts mm -hmm. on the planet now, isn't he? You know, he's had a lot of exposure, but this is a, a person that uh, is, has learned a lot. But, but more interestingly than that, I think he's still learning. So on the second podcast we filmed about a month ago, um, he's got like a new version of the book coming out with some new stuff in it. He's got lots of conversations going on with, I think with like Andrew Huberman and um, Stanford and, and all these different things. And he's, he's talking about all sorts of developments. Um, and I was like, oh, he's not finished. He's not finished by a long shot. So he, again, going back to what I was saying at the start, you've got somebody here that now has got this, this fantastic niche of breath. And his other book was called uh, Deep, I think, which is also linked to breathing. But then he's a journalist. So he's an investigative journalist. And on top of that, he's a fantastic communicator. So you kind of put all those skills together. It's no wonder he's done such a, a mm. great job of getting the message of breath out there. Um, but one thing that was towards the end of that book, which I really liked, and Patrick will mention this as well, is breathing is not a cure for everything. And I think we've got to be careful sometimes because we think breathing can cure every single thing. Um, and even though Patrick's new book is called The Breathing Cure, he said on many occasions, um, you know, we, we thought about that title a lot. And I do caveat it many times that it is a cure for a lot of stuff, but not for everything. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very, very careful about that. Um, and he gets a lot of people apparently James now sitting on planes going, oh, my, my, my niece has got this disease or my uncle's got this. What breathing exercise would you recommend for that? And that's when I think he pulled back and go, you know, th there's limitations to everything uh, that we know. Um, the last big thing that I got from, uh, from James Nestor was not breathing, but chewing. And, and this has sent me down the proper rabbit hole now. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I'm not finished yet. So uh, I'm sure we'll talk about mouth taping in a bit. And I've got my, my micro pore tape ready if we do talk about it and all that sort of stuff at night. But um, this, I, I wolf my food down and I've got terrible posture that I've had for years. And um, I don't chew my food properly or didn't chew my food properly. And I'm bending over my plate like this, and my elbows are often on the table. And you think back, you think, well, where does that where does that come from? Get your elbows off the table. Oh, it's like a posh thing. No, no, posture's massive. Posture's so important. I know you're but you're a big advocate of posture, but posture's ridiculously important when you're eating. If you're kind of crunched over, um, 
and you're just swallowing bits of food that hasn't been masticated properly. I did say masticated. <laughs> um, if you're doing all of that sort of stuff, um, your body's got more things it has to digest and it's harder and it can cause IBS, which I've, I've had for many years. Um, but also this, these muscles that are in here, they need to be worked properly. And if we're having smoothies and soups and shakes and you know, you name it, baby food. baby food. We don't exercise this muscle properly uh, or muscles. Um, and what's even more scary is um, combine some mouth breathing with that. Um, and people's faces are looking completely different from our ancestors and they're narrower and we can't breathe properly. And we've got all sorts of problems that get us later in life. But the thing which, again, I'm not an expert when it comes to chewing at all, but the thing that I'm starting to learn is you can start to reverse some of that sort of stuff, even at my age and even at, at later ages. Um, so I'm really trying to not, not only consciously breathe, I'm really trying to consciously eat now as well. And that's no elbows on the table. Uh, and that's chewing properly, enjoying my food. When you swallow, make the swallow maybe a little bit more difficult to work out those muscles as well. Nasal breathe while you're doing it. Don't, you know, eat the food. Um, and that's a really exciting thing. It's not a quick win. It's not a mm. quick fix. I think I've frozen again, have I? Am I back? No, fine. Um, I'm back. Um, it's not a quick fix like a lot of things. I think people are looking for silver bullets, but uh, I think, you know, that's something that I'm going to take forward. And I've become this person now I never thought I would be, which is I don't, I'm not the first one to finish my dinner at the table. And I'm like, oh, you're eating a bit fast today. That's always been me. I was always the first one to finish. I had this really embarrassing situation when I was, uh, I don't know, 14, 15, when you're really at that awkward age. And I went around some friend's um, house for dinner and I finished my dinner 10 minutes before everybody else. So I'm just sitting there really <laughs> awkward. I've just remembered this now, actually. And everyone's just enjoying their food. And because they're a family, they've obviously been taught to eat properly. And I just didn't listen as a kid, clearly. So I'm just wolfing all this food down. They're just really awkward. It was one of the most awkward 10 minute periods of my, you know, adolescent life that was. So, so yeah, slow down, eat your food. We've got a podcast coming out with Dr. Mike Mew um, at some point very near. It's been recorded. Um, and I think the title is going to be Shut Your Mouth. Um, and stand up straight. I think that's what he was saying um, it should be called. And I love that because it's like, get the posture right, shut your mouth, use your nose, chew properly. Um, so yeah, that was the, that was a, a big takeaway from James is, is let's chew, let's chew properly, let's chew slowly. Um, and, and he talks a lot about that the, the de-evolution of the skull, the human skull over the last few generations, which is, which is horrific and scary. And I know you know a lot about this because of, it's, you know, it's potato and, and oxygen advantage. Um, probably the last one I'll just mention is, um, a lady called Diana Medina. And there's a really interesting story here, I think anyway, which is I labeled, uh, one of my breathing exercises, holotropic inspired. And I got quite a firm email from the holotropic Institute saying, you can't use that word. It's, it's, you know, it's protected and uh, yet that's not a holotropic video. And so I took that down and then I, I spoke to this lady and said, I don't suppose you'd be interested in doing a podcast, would you, about what, what this is? Because, you know, I'm still learning. Um, and she recommended this lady called Diana, who's worked with, um, I think his name's Stan Gra 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 Ofsky, Gra Off. I probably said his name terrible now, but the guy that invented holotropic breath work in the sort of 60s. Um, and uh, she'd worked closely with him. And her name was Diana Medina. And it's been one of the most well-received podcasts um, that I've done. Um, and she just brought with her this healing energy. And I was just thinking before we went live, actually, all the different types of breath work, because people go into breath work for, for so many things. You know, is it for health? Is it for spirituality? Is it for mindfulness? Um, is it for you know, a number of different reasons? Is it for athletic ability? Um, is it for asthma? Whatever. You know, there's so many different reasons why people get stuck into breath work. And this one leaned a little bit more toward the spiritual side. Um, so I wasn't really sure how that would be perceived, but people absolutely loved it and they loved her. And, and I did too. I think I even said a couple of times, this is such a lovely podcast. She had such a, such a warm, loving nature about her. And this person that, you know, has done probably so many uh, holotropic experiences. And, you know, um, I've had some of those experiences. I've never done any psychedelic drugs, but I've had psychedelic experiences through breath work. Um, and they shifted my, my thinking. I've only done that a couple of times. Um, but, but that podcast, it just showed me the amount of love and I don't, I don't know spirituality is the right word, but just the amount of love and care and energy that came through breath work through this person. And she's in the medical profession. She, uh, she works in the hospital, I think, somewhere in America. So she's a, a trained 
physician of some sort, but yet she still leans on what we might class as a little bit woo-woo in some places, you know, this this deep breathing exercise stuff that's going on. So, so yeah, that's just some of the stuff. I can keep talking all day about them. Baz Rutan, UFC world champion, you know, he has this O2 trainer I don't have nearby, but had strength in your lungs. Stig Severinsen, breath-holding champion, 20 minutes, you know, of holding his breath underwater, which obviously, safety reasons, don't recommend and be very, very careful with breath and water. Um, Laird Hamilton, big wave surfer, talking about being fit and stronger and be able to hold his breath for longer in case a wave puts him under the water. And the thing, the last bit I'll say before I hand back, because I, I realize again, I can keep yabbering on. <laughs> with um, with uh, Laird, I was talking about my problems with breath holds for a long period and how I go into panic, which I know you and I have talked about before. And he said, swap the word panic for urgency. And that was a bit of a mind shift for me as well, because as we know, if you if you've ever played with a pulse oximeter and you do a breath hold you probably still got loads of oxygen in your blood you know so you're not running out of oxygen the primary stimulus for us wanting to breathe from a breath hold is is a buildup of co2 and if we've got poor co2 tolerance then we need to you know we feel the urgency uh to breathe so um it's just that piece for me around remembering it's not panic it's urgency don't push yourself too much but at the same time know everything's going to be okay and you can breathe again whenever you need to so that was a, a big takeaway i got from laird but anyway there you go. There are some of the takeaways from some plenty, of the podcasts that I've Plenty had. there. That's excellent. We're getting some great comments on YouTube saying great info. Um, I'm just going to do my little YouTube bit now. You'll be proud of me, Mike. So I'm going to go subscribe. If you're on YouTube, you can subscribe to Mike's channel, which is YouTube slash Take a Deep Breath. My channel is Grey Cause, YouTube dot, uh, not dot Grey Cause, YouTube Grey Cause. And if you're on Facebook and YouTube, you can like and share as well, please. Any questions? So please do pop any questions in the comments or any questions in the chat. I've got plenty more questions to ask Mike and he's going to go do his a little breathing practice in a minute. But start to feed any questions through if you've got questions. I'm sure you've got lots of them. I'd like to go to your day job now. Let me just turn those graphics off. Um, because you're not a full-time breath worker, although one would expect mm. with all your experience and the podcasting and everything you're doing, how, how do you manage to fit in your day job and what, what is your day job? Yeah, so I've, I've basically worked for a number of corporations, so it's not really one specific, but I've, I've been a coach many times. Um, and I tend to do contract work these days. Um, but for me, it's 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 about how do you keep that balance? How, how do you do two or three things? And a lot of people say that to me. I think, number one, it actually doesn't take that much time, the, 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 the kind of take a deep breath thing. I've got a lot of processes automated. Um, it's something I'm always thinking about. And the other thing as well is, it's not work. It really isn't work. If this was work, like when I used to do the, uh, the wedding videos, um, that was proper work. I would do a wedding video on a, a Saturday. I would come home absolutely exhausted because I've done like 10 hours on my feet. Uh, and you're trying to deal with a very upset bride sometimes and, you know, some family members. You're trying to, you know, people get drunk and start touching your lens of your camera. Um, and, and that's not good. So, uh, so I would be absolutely exhausted by those. Uh, whereas with this, you know, it's a, it's a setup in the house. Um, I get to practice the exercises. I think, oh, that'd be a good exercise to put on. That's what I'm, I'm trying at the minute. Um, and so I think that's the thing. I was talking to a friend the other day and they were asking the, the same question. Uh, and it's so cheesy, but it's, it isn't work. I absolutely love, uh, I love YouTubing. I love practicing breath work. I love talking to people about breath work. Um, and so I think if this was, I mean, we tried, uh, we tried to do, well, we still do. My, my, my partner, she works, she does some work on Amazon. You know, she'll, she'll, bring in some stuff and then she'll sell it um, from, from China and then she'll sell it uh, on the Amazon warehouse. Um, oh, I found that so dull. I found it so dull and it was so boring for me to do. And it was, it was real effort and real work and she didn't want to do it and would procrastinate over it. Whereas every day I'm just looking forward to thinking about breath or reading a book on breath or, you know, wh whatever it is. Um, and, and I think that's a, a good lesson in life is, you know, and it's so cheesy because we've heard it, haven't we? It's a fridge magnet thing, but find something you love. And I think the other thing as well, I think this is really important is do you, just because you love something, there's a lot of stuff saying make your side hustle your day job. And I kind of flip flop on that a little bit. I was thinking if I did do this full time, would I love it as much as, 
as I do now. Whereas in my day job and day jobs I've had in the past, it's not one specific thing. Um, I work with big groups of people. I get a lot of interaction. My brain gets tested in different ways. And that brings in the, you know, that brings in the money to, to keep living and paying your mortgage and all that sort of stuff. Whereas taking it rest obviously very much a, a passion thing. So, so I think it's a case of just finding what you love and, and I'm, I've, I've done some time management courses. I'm, I'm, I, I'm very precious of my time. I very precious of being in nature. So for example, on a Sunday, I have to get out with the dog and my girlfriend and we'll go for a big long walk in the forest or, or, or something. Um, so I, I'm just a little bit anal when it comes to kind of time allocation. So I've got so much time to do, take a deep breath, so much time to the day job, and then all of this time to, to live a, a good life, you know, and have I mastered that? And of course not, but but that's kind of my aspirations is to make sure that no matter what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, like, you know, saying yes to today, because I absolutely love talking to you, Gray, and I think you're fantastic. And I, you know, it's a real privilege to be to be talking on your show. Um, but it's balancing that with, okay, later we're going to have a nice meal together, me and my girlfriend, and we're going to go for a walk after and, you know, have some time. And, and I think it's just making sure that you have that balance in life, no matter what you do. Ah, that's excellent. It sounds very structured and organized and planned. Um, mm. What is interesting is what do you think you've brought from the breath work into your corporate world and so into your, into your world, particularly thinking in terms of COVID, because a lot of people in the corporate world are in, have been working in offices uh, and then suddenly they're taken out of the office and they're working from home. Mm. So there's a big, big change gone on, obviously, from the point of view of COVID and over the past year. But just in terms yes. of that, maybe, but also in terms of improvement of maybe your work, have you taken any of your breath work into, into that? Mm. So uh, I remember when I came back from, uh, I did a Tony Robbins uh, seminar in 2018. And he has something called priming, which is a wonderful breathing practice where you do a version of breath of fire, arms up in the air and you, you know, you do this and you're blowing, you know, you're blowing in and out through your nose and you do 30 of those breaths and you breathe normally and you do three rounds and then you, you, you focus on some gratitude and some things you're trying to, to work on. Um, and I thought I'll take my senior management team through that when I was working for an old corporation. And uh, it was a bit of a disaster because, you know, stuff's flying out of your nose when you're doing that exercise um, <laughs> and you're in a corporate setting. So so that was my first kind of uh, folly into into corporate breath work. Um, since then, no, I really don't merge the two worlds that much um, up until very recently, actually, when I did a did a talk um, to, to some people within one of the corporations. Um, but I really I really don't merge the two as much because I'm very much in one mode and then in the other. And maybe there's something later in life where I can I can mix those two. That would be you know, wonderful. Um, but for me, I think it's about what do I do when it mm. comes to being in a corporate world? So I don't know if you can tell right now, but I've I've invested in a standing desk. You know, this was only, I say only, it was 200 pounds from Ikea, best 200 pounds I've ever spent because I've got posture problems and um, it was a real good investment. It's not an electric one. It's one that I have to use the handle for. Have I frozen again? Yeah, it's frozen a little bit there. Keep going. Shall I keep going? Um, and, uh, oh, look at that. That's a, that's a terrible shot as well. It's a good shot. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can yeah, back to you. and come back to you. So let's see if it's moving there. Let's come back. No, it's still frozen. Still frozen. Okay. Hmm. It might come back. I... And... Okay. I'll, I'll talk for a second and talk then uh, we'll see. We've it... got a couple of questions yeah. coming in. If anybody's got any okay. questions, then do sort of like fire questions in. Drop any questions in the chat box or in the comment box if you're on uh, Zoom. If anybody wants to uh, actually just unmute on Zoom as well and ask any questions, then please feel free to do, do that also. Let's see if we can find if he's gone back. Shall I log out and log back in again? Because it's been frozen now for a good minute, hasn't it? Yeah, maybe if you want to just do that quickly. We've got. I'll, I'll jump into a couple of questions here, actually. And then when you jump back in, we can hopefully uh, grab that. So let's just... I've got a question here from Jan on, on YouTube. So you are asking... Here's Mike ringing up again. Let's see if he can come in. Let's have a go there. Yes, there we go. Okay. So yeah, you're coming back on. I can see you. Uh, that's good. That was quick. We just got one question from Jan uh, on YouTube asking, what breath work would you suggest for someone in the middle of a panic attack? Now, obviously, yeah, so when we're, to... sorry, I was just going to say, when we're, obviously, when we're giving information on Zoom, it's difficult because we don't know the person. But just in, yes. in, in sort of like general terms, what sort of thing would you uh, recommend, Mike? 
it's yeah that's no, it's good and it'd be good to get your thoughts as well um because actually i don't know if we've even spoke about this but you were my coach so i i uh i, I very much tip my cap to you so when it comes to, to, to breath work as well because you've been in the, the science side of it far longer than i have but what has worked well for me because i've been on the on the verge of a panic attack a couple of times um and, and belissa Veranich talks about this um on uh on the breath cast that we did um for a lot of people it's um they get stuck in freeze um or they might get stuck on an, an inhale so it's, sometimes it's a and yeah even then i could feel the panic go up because i'm trying to get more air in, but the lungs are full um so for me it's about an exhale first so a big exhale out um, if you can use the nose brilliant but i think it's about clearing those lungs and, and what that tends to do is reset the breathing system a little bit because if you're fully in and you're, you're trying to get more in there's no more that can go in and you start to panic and obviously the oxygen's running out and you know no fresh stuff can get in so big exhale out and then use the nose and funnily enough one of the uh uh top uh, videos right now on the channel. Uh, the second most popular uh, video right now is um, how to stop a panic attack or, or, or try some panic attack. And what that is, it's a it's a slow exhale out and a slow inhale in, but the exhale out double the amount of the inhale. So sometimes it's called one, two breathing or two, one breathing, um, but it's using the nose and it's just slowing everything right down and, and getting the exhale and, and just trying to bring it back. And if you look at that video and look at the comments, um, you know, I think it's up to sort of 60,000 views now. It's, it's just got absolutely exploded that, which is quite tragic in a way because people are clearly searching that term, mm -hmm. how to stop a panic attack, mm -hmm. and they're finding that video. So so actually it's quite awful in a way if you think about the success of that video. Um, but it's, it's clearly a tool and it's helping people. Um, but it's just about, I think, being consciously aware of your breath, getting out of that stuck uh, inhale, getting an exhale out, and, and trying to use the nose and just slowing everything down. That's, that's what I would suggest would, would be very helpful. Brilliant. Um, I'd be quite interested in you talking about these reaching over movements. So can you give us a little bit more information on yeah. what you were doing? So, so um, if you if you read uh, Breathing for Warriors, which is back there, and you can get it from thebreathingclass.com, which is Belissa's book, she's got a whole load of exercises. And great, again, nothing new for you here, but the stuff around cat-cow poses and, uh, you know, a lot of stretches. But this one I really like. So this is Can you give us a little so demo? Can, get... can you talk us through it? Yeah. And we can all have a little yeah, go. Uh, yeah, so you get the get the um, arm really tight to the head, so there's you know there's not a lot of space here, and then you just you just twist over and breathe out, and then. I can see somebody there. doing it laid on their couch there on Zoom. Maybe maybe best sitting up. <laughs> And you can just do that. I, I do sort of 10 of those. And what you can do, you'll, you'll get a feel. Like when you do a bit of yoga or stretching, you'll get a feel for what's tight and what's not. So I often find it's quite tight here at this part of the ribs. So I might just gently, gently lean back a little bit. Yeah. And what's the breathing pattern on that? Are you breathing in as you're moving in one direction or? Yeah. I, I mean, again, I think the big thing here is, is nasal breathing is obviously key to all this sort of stuff and, and trying to use the belly and the diaphragm. Um, but you're just trying to expand the rib cage at the same time. So breathing in through the nose. A nice stretch. And then exhale out. And I'll tend to do this on a chair. And then I haven't got a chair in the room right now. The second one that she taught me was the twist. And you get a chair with a, a, a good back on it. You put, kind of put your leg over the side. You can see it on the podcast, actually. And um, you kind of tilt your pelvis forward and you breathe in. So your belly's really sticking out. And then you get the chair and you twist and you breathe out. You keep going, keep going, keep going. And you get a real deep twist and you can feel it everywhere. Obviously, with any exercise like this, you don't want to push yourself too much. You don't want to do mm. any damage. You need to feel your body. Um, but those plus the cat cow um, really start to kind of open up the intercostal muscles in the ribs starts to you know i'm very tight here i'm very tight my shoulders she's got a program and i believe a lot of it's talking about breathing into the back which again i know gray you've talked about so so again i would say i've just picked up these couple of tips and tricks from belissa but if you want to go deep into that which i would recommend she, she's got a course and she's got a book and a couple of books um but yeah I, that's part of my morning routine is the arm over that couple of twists couple of cat cows just to kind of get everything a bit more open and uh, try and stop this kind of forward head tilted mm -hmm. posture mm -hmm. um and then try and free up the belly and the diaphragm as well with that you know really really emphasize the belly coming out you know you know i can't, luckily you can't <laughs> see my belly right now but you know stick it right back, out and uh, further back stuck so it we back can in. see <laughs> 
so yeah so so, so that that that, that uh, I really like that I really like that she took the time to to take me through that and that was a real gift that she gave me because I was just not breathing functionally at all even though I talked about the nose all of this was just locked and I still think this is so true with breath. You don't know what you don't know. So mm-hmm. even when I was talking to Stig a couple of weeks ago, me and Stig have had over three hours of conversations now, two on a podcast, you know, one and a half on the phone, um, or two separate podcasts, still learn stuff. You know, he can suck his diaphragm right in. He's doing all these different exercises with her. It's fascinating. You know, he's big, big into breath holds. And he will say, um, you know, what's the best barometer of how you're feeling in the morning? You know, you can do all these different sleep gadgets, which I know we've talked about, um, but he'll just do a couple of breath holds first thing and he'll get a sense of how long his, his hold is. He'll get a sense of how well he slept last night because he's so tuned into his breath and he knows kind of what his breath holds look like from a good night of sleep and a bad night of sleep if he's got anxiety going on or stress or anything like that all those things are affecting kind of the breath hold time so he uses that as a a very natural barometer of how he's feeling excellent jan's just asking a question please can you tell me the podcast you're referring to keep up the great work yes yeah so thank you thank you jan um it's uh so if you just type in uh, Belissa, B-E-L-I-S-A, Varanich, which is V-R-A-N-I-C-H, take a deep breath or breath cast. You'll, you'll see a big pink thumbnail come up and you'll see a book title called Breathe and then it will be that one there. Um, I'm sure we can we can put a link to it somewhere as well. Um, but yeah, uh, through that, you'll find her website as well and you'll find her books and, and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, wonderful, wonderful person. Yeah, that's great. And as, as you say, all, all of the content, all of the broadcasts, all of the podcasts, the breathcasts are all free on Mike's site, which is which is excellent. We've got another question coming in on YouTube. The Zoomers are very quiet. Sheila's just gone, but Sheila says, thanks, Mike. She had to rush off for another Zoom. But we've got another question from uh, EB on YouTube. Is it true that the exhale breath is the relaxation breath? And if so, why? Oh, that's good a good question. one. <laughs> yeah. Have you got a week? <laughs> you see me. So, um, so yeah, so uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman, who's a neuroscientist, he put a fantastic uh, clip onto Instagram um, around December time. And it shows, I think it was like an x-ray, but like a video x-ray where you could see everything. And I think on the, on the inhale, diaphragm's going down and out. And it's, and it's drawing more blood into the heart and the heart starts to beat faster. And on the inhale, diaphragm comes back up again into a kind of resting position and uh, kind of squeezes a bit less blood in, out of the heart and everything kind of slows down a little bit. Um, and Gray will probably be better to explain this next bit, but when it comes to the, the vagus nerve, which is like a nerve that's linked to all of our organs, there's a connection there with um, the exhale. And there's this stuff around a doubling of the exhale, because if you... If you th- this is the classic story they use, isn't it? If there's a saber toothed tiger, I don't know why we always use saber toothed tigers. If there's a saber toothed tiger chasing you, how is your breathing going to be? Is it going to be nice and slow and calm, or is it going to be rapid and deep and ready for you to fight and flight? You know, um, and it's going to be that, isn't it? So, so your body is conditioned for that kind of rapid breath, that classic as dysfunctional breathing, that loud breathing, uh, maybe shallow breathing, because we're in that kind of fl- fight or flight mode. Um, we've gone into parasympathetic, uh, sorry, sympathetic state, and we're ready to get the hell out of there. Um, now, the difference of that is when we're, we're relaxed and we're calm and we're breathing slowly and we're breathing quietly um, and, you know, we're, we're extending the exhale, everything just starts to calm down. The whole system starts to calm down and signals are going around the body to go, there isn't a saber toothed tiger here right now because if there is, we'd have to run and we'd have to switch on to that, that other mode. So that long, slow exhale out just seems to feel calm and wonderful. And There's also another bit for me here, which is around the meditation aspect of it because when you do a, a breath in and a breath out, There's just something about, I don't know, the ocean or that sound, that slow, long breath out. It just makes me relax and feel calm. So there's there's definitely something about the sound of that breath as well, if you're doing a nice, slow breathing exercise like that. But yeah, great. It'd be great to see if I've missed anything or there's any extra points you can add there, because I know you could talk about this for, for a very long time. No, you mentioned Andrew Huberman there. He's got a great, um, the psychological sigh, which is a two inhales and then a long exhale. <sighs> either through the mouth or through the nose and that he did some st- studies on on sleep 
and it was showing that in the sleep you tend to go and that tends to happen so that out breath is a relaxation it's a it's a sign of safety if it's a sign of comfort and feeling safe i think and if you look at it again like you say from from heart rate point of view every time you breathe in the heart rate increases every time you breathe out the heart rate decreases so even if you're breathing say you're breathing your heart is beating 60 breaths per minute actually you don't want those breath your heart is beating 60 beats per minute not 60 breaths per minute those beats you want some variation in those beats mm -hmm. and that when they're looking at training is called heart rate variability so if you've got sort of like good heart rate variability so that your heart rate goes up as you breathe in and the heart rate comes down as you breathe out that brings you into sort of like that relaxation uh, so there's just have a, a little like play around with that extended exhale again with like Mike mm -hmm. says there without without forcing anything uh, we've got a question coming in on um, zoom I'm trying to look at two chat things going on here do you have you continued with the progress with the cold and do you have a daily all oh, right so have you continued with the progress with the cold and do you have a daily practice and if so what Oh, good questions. So uh, my neighbors think I'm mental because in my garden, there is a bathtub, uh, <laughs> which we bought from Facebook uh, a few months ago. So I could have some cold baths. Um, do I do it every day? Uh, no, um, I, I really need to kind of psych myself up. And the funny thing is, once you do it, once you've left it a long period of time, like anything, you, you get quite nervous by it. And I remember I started to have nice baths again, probably in late October. Um, and the first one was awful, awful. I've got some video footage somewhere because I made my poor girlfriend film it. And um, <laughs> I, I was in there less than, less than 30 seconds. I thought, oh, that was a waste of water. I did use it the next day. Um, but by the third ice bath, I did five minutes, no problem. Um, and it really was no problem. It was a cold day. You know, it wasn't frozen, but it was a cold day. But it was, it was the same temperature it was two, three days before. So I found that really interesting. And around that time, I was doing cold showers as well. Now, funnily enough, since I got back from Poland, I got, I got sick. Um, got sick when I came back from Poland. Not because of Poland. I just had awful flu, awful flu. Um, and I haven't done it since then. So I haven't had an ice bath for probably two months, two and a half months. So, so I think I need to take an action there to, to fill that bath up. We also got a dog a little while ago. So all the garden furniture has been put into the bath so she can't chew it. So my bath has become this kind of dumping ground, but I could have a cold shower. So so for me, my daily practice is is, is very simple. So um, it's it's a bit sporadic, but, but what there is always is there's a morning uh, walk, which now I have a dog. So I want to get sunlight. We spoke about this on, on my podcast last week with Gray. I want to get daylight in my eyes as soon as I wake up. I don't want to look at the phone screen. I want to just get out. So about 6.15, 6.30, I'll get the dog. Um, and walk straight out and we'll go and try and get a bit of sunrise or a bit of sun in the eyes. And sometimes I'll stand there and I look like a bit of a plonker and the dog's just sitting there enjoying it as well. Um, and sometimes I'll wear flip-flops so I can I can take my feet out and put them on the grass and there's some dog poo about it, so you've got to be careful. But um, I will I will try and ground as well because there's some, some lovely benefits with grounding. So, so, so I'll do that, then I'll come back and then my girlfriend will take the dog and then that hour's my hour. So in that hour, I will do some sort of um, some cardio at the minute because the gyms are shut. I'm just walking up and down the stairs sort of 20 minutes and doing press-ups in between. Now, when I do the press-ups, what I do is I'll do my best not to breathe. So I won't do any Wim Hof breathing or anything like that. I'll just take a normal breath in, a normal breath out. And on the exhale, I'll do 10 press ups. And I won't push myself. If I start to get into too much panic, I'll stop. But very often now I can kind of do 10 press ups on an empty, um, empty breath. And there's, you know, some benefits there around um, increasing your tolerance to CO2 and, you know, while you're in a, a state of movement. Um, so I'll do that. And then it's the stretching and stuff I've told you before. There's twisting, um, there's there's overarm stuff, um, there's there's trying to work out the top of my back, um, and it's just trying to open everything up because even with a standing desk, I will um I will still be hunched over sometimes. And you've got a problem with the standing desk, sometimes you can be like like that. So so um so no, so there's a lot of stretching that happens. I've got a foam roller down there and a tennis ball I use on my feet, and I've got a whole whole routine that I've kind of took from different things. I've got a, a belt to just kind of stretch my arms out. I'm extremely inflexible. Um, and I'm not sure where that comes from because it's not in my family. So it's, it's clearly something I've, I've done to myself. Um, and then the bit I'm not great at is, is journaling. So I've got a journal and I'll try and just do some freehand journaling. Um, now, throughout all of this, 
my big practice is 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 nasal breathing um so i don't really push myself to the point where i have to go to mouth and we spoke again last week about having to go to mouth sometimes um and that's okay because it's quite nuanced it shouldn't be nose forever there's times when we have to use the mouth but when i'm doing my sort of 20 minutes going up and down the stairs i'm going at a pace where i'm sweaty but my 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 mouth is shut uh, and when i'm doing my stretching and my press ups and all that sort of stuff the mouth is shut or i'm, I'm doing a, a breath hold and then really apart from that i just do different things throughout the day and throughout the week I, you know i had a migraine um when i was sick during that period um i did three four five rounds of of, of you know a version of wim hof breathing um just to kind of clear me let, let me feel better uh, and it did it got rid of it um you know i'll do breath holds sometimes throughout the day just i'm trying to build my co2 tolerance up um and i love a bit of box breathing as well and the next exercise we can talk about in a second which i'm going to take you guys through uh, which i don't do enough of is humming breath so we can do that maybe towards the end of this um but yeah my practice it really involves uh sometimes it's not as sexy as people want it to be that i'm doing thousands of breathing exercises for me the biggest thing that i learned last year from patrick and through and through gray was functional breathing using the nose doing some exercise using the nose and just trying to make those 25,000 breaths a day as functional as, as possible. We're getting some excellent uh, questions going on here. If we could meditate, if you could meditate anywhere on earth, where would you go or does it matter? Very deep. <laughs> Love it. I, I saw an episode of Black Mirror where the guy went off on a 10-day meditation retreat and he was in like this glass box. He was like the CEO of a version of Facebook and I thought, oh, I'd like that. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I guess the the real answer everyone probably is looking for, or the reality is, it, it does. It shouldn't matter, should it? You know, you could be able to meditate on the bus, or in the car, or in bed, or on in the toilet. Bath. You know, in your bath. Uh, what's that? In your bath. In, in your bath. bath. Yeah. I'm glad you've got a northern accent as well. <laughs> <laughs> in the in the bath. Um, so so I I don't think, but but I uh, I spent a month in Bali in 2019. So I think the same place that that Gray was at the, the yoga barn. Um, was it a yoga barn you were at as well? Yeah, if I made that up. Yeah, so we were at the same place. Right. One of the biggest. Uh, I, I I enjoyed the meditations there. We did like a gong meditation, um, and we did some other meditations, and that's lovely because um, as they're describing stuff to you and you're getting guided. Uh, they're going, oh, the, the jungle outside, they might say. And you look out the window, and there is a jungle outside your, your window. And you're on this lovely wooden floor. And, um, that, that was really nice. Um, but probably the best meditation I've had is, is after the Wim Hof stuff and um, in, in a uh, community as well. So, so what I mean by that is when we did a lot of deep breathing, I still I see I see that as a meditation because often you're focusing on the air coming in, the air going out, or your belly, um, and being around other people that are doing the same thing. I really love that. I really love that tribal um, effort where everybody, excuse me, is together. Um, so that's probably one of the most powerful meditations I've had. But I, short answer is it, it shouldn't matter, should it? It should be everywhere. I think. Excellent. Um, well, I know we've we've had an hour already, so that's gone really, really wow. quickly. But I would like you, as you said, just to share one sort of like little breathing practice with us all, just to set us all up for the for the weekend. And um, what would what would be your choice? Uh, I think you, you mentioned humming. I love humming. So yeah, yeah. So so um, for me, there's there's so many, isn't there? I was like, oh cracky, what am I gonna what am I gonna? How do you pick your favourite child? You know. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so for me, I was thinking, I changed it a couple of times in my head and I thought, no, humming breath is really great. So I'll just explain a little bit why I think it's great. Um, it is the best way for me to slow my breathing pattern down. And I think if you Google firefighter humming breath on, uh, on YouTube, they did this test where they have, firefighters have a oxygen canister behind them and so they can measure quite accurately how much, um, air they use them. And, uh, they would see how many steps they could do with all the kit on. And then they asked them to hum and they could get significantly further on, on the oxygen because they were slowing everything down. So that, that I think is really great because it's, it's just, it's a really cool tool. Number two, this is, is it, this is my favorite. It's silly and it's fun. And as adults, we're boring sometimes. <laughs> and so to hum, I think is great. And I think, you know, there's that childlike love of life that we need to embrace more of because serious people don't hum, do they? You know, we've got corporate jobs and we should be nice and quiet and respectful. I, I don't know. I just love the idea of, of just like um adults humming i just think it's, it's it gives me a real smile on my face um and i think the other bit as well is around uh, nasal nitric oxide so 
this gas that's being released out of our kind of sinuses. Um, when you exhale, I can't remember the percentage now, but there's a significant increase in the amount of nasal nitric oxide. If you've ever seen, I'm sure Gray's done this, but Patrick as well, he will talk about you take a normal breath in, normal breath out, you'll do a breath hold, and you'll do some breath hold training, let's say. And he'll always make sure, Patrick will say, now breathe back in using your nose. Uh, and what you're doing there is you're taking advantage of that nasal nitric oxide. And um, some of the benefits of that, I think it helps with um, sterilization of the air. So, you know, we talk about COVID and mouth breathers and, you know, that, that, that first line of defense is your nose, isn't it? You know, you've got a place to filter the air, to warm it, to cool it, to put the right pressure in, but also to release some nasal nitric oxide. But the other thing as well is it helps with the absorption of oxygen into the tissue, because when you've got um, nasal, nasal nitric oxide present, that allows the ability to get that oxygen into the tissue better. So if we're mouth breathing, we're not really getting any of those benefits. So one of the reasons that humming breath is so good is it allows you to release more nature, nasal nitric oxide. So that's some of the benefits of why we should do this. And like I say, it sounds silly. And it's silly. I love that. Uh, just anecdotally, again, when I was when we did um, trail running in Costa Brava, one guy we were running with really was struggling with a nasal breathing, and we added the hum. And it's interesting you talk about that firefighter one because I've, I've not seen that. I look at that, but we added the hum on the exhale. And he was going, mm. oh, my God, I can do it. And actually, there was more power in the movement. And it, it was easier to run and nasal breathe by humming. So, yeah, mm. definitely. Yeah, it's wonderful. Take us and through it's, um, it. Give, us, give us a little humming practice. Let's do it. Let's do it then. Okay. All right. So, all right, find a comfortable wise. place if you've not. No, I'm just saying I was going to do a quick time because it's always interesting how long we can, we can maybe hum out for. It's not a competition, but it's always interesting to know what that looks like. So what we'll say is we'll, we'll take a breath in through the nose in a second, and then we'll all hum out together. Now, what I like to do here is find the frequency that makes your face vibrate the most. Because you can hum in a way that mm, nothing's really happening. But if you start, mm, you start to find, oh my God, it's really vibrating here. So that to me is, is the sweet spot. It's playing around with your pitch a little bit. I'm a bit tone deaf, so I can't tell you if it's a C or an A minor or anything like that. What I can tell you is once I start playing about with it and I get that vibration, that to me feels like it's something good going on there. So, so we'll take a normal breath in through the nose in a second. We'll pause for a second and then we'll just all hum out together and just go as long as you can um, and then when you get to the bottom if you feel like you can pause for a couple of seconds do so and then we'll go back in again and we'll do another couple so we'll do a couple of rounds and, and see how we get on so hopefully it might ready. be quite nice if you're on zoom if you want to unmute to see if we can get a communal hum oh, this yes, friday please. afternoon to see whether see whether the internet crashes with everybody humming at the same time so if you feel for feel for unmuting on zoom on zoom then please do so Okay, so let's uh, let's just get ourselves a bit ready. So um, it's just always good just to have a, just a tiny bit of a stretch, open things up a little bit. Maybe just think about where your belly is now as well right now. Just, just bring attention to your belly. Is it sucked in or is it let go? And if it is sucked in, see if you can just let that belly go a little bit and let that out. And just, you know, think about where your breathing is right now. Hopefully your nose is unblocked and you can do this exercise. And actually the humming breath can help with unblocking the, the nose as well. So what we'll do now is let's take that normal breath in through the nose. And then we'll hum out together. Mm. That was 10 seconds and we'll just pause and then breathe back in again through the nose. And I'm emphasizing the sounds here for you. I'll go again. Mm. Eleven seconds, and breathe back in through the nose, and then go again. Mm. That was thirteen seconds. Really enjoy the inhale back in. We'll do one more. That was about 15 seconds and breathe back in. 
And so I would just suggest practicing that where you can. Um, I like to play a little fun game with myself to see how long I can get the exhale to go. Um, and it's surprising sometimes how, how long you can actually get that exhale to go. Whereas if you were to, to hold a full breath or to hold a, uh, an empty breath, sometimes the, the, the variation can be different. So it's a, it's a wonderful exercise because there's something very calming about it as well, where, where sometimes I find if you're just holding your breath, um, again, that urgency or panic can, can creep in a little bit. Whereas I find with this, it's, it's quite a soothing uh, method, you know, a modality. Um, so yeah, give that a go. Leave us leave some comments that how you got on with that as well. Was it easy for you to do? Did it unblock your nose? Did you feel any more peace or calm afterwards? Did you feel a bit stressed afterwards? Because sometimes if you're not used to those long, slow breaths um, and you've got, you know, maybe not the greatest CO2 tolerance, you might start to feel um, more urgency or panic there. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to get your thoughts, how you guys uh, found that. But it's, it's a lovely practice. It's a silly practice. And it's, it's something free you can take with you everywhere just to slow your, your breathing system down. Brilliant. Gillian says thanks. Feels better for that. So already, uh, Gillian on on Zoom is feeling feeling better for that. Fantastic. That's brilliant, Mike. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate that. I'm sure everybody else did. Brilliant to hear your story and hear how you got involved in breath work and and what again. I think knowing you and working with you, we, we meet up once a month usually and just have a little chat. Mike helps me a lot with my work and we just share things. And I think for me like just seeing the the authenticity and your your true passion and i like what you said at the beginning like yourself and like with james nestor is you're still learning it was we're not here as experts and anybody mm -hmm. who comes out and says this is the way to do it then you want to be a bit wary of that but it's interesting that somebody pointed out on your channel that actually i, I really love it because you do, do feel like you're learning with them and i think that's really really important from a coach's point of view yeah so thank just, just something you. Patrick said, just to, just to jump in there quickly, yeah, Patrick yeah. just said something. Because when I had my first uh, Oxygen Advantage uh, training with Patrick, I had so many questions for him. I was like, right, here we go. And, and it, not very often, but sometimes you go, we don't know. We don't know the answer to that, whatever it was that I was asking him, because we, we still don't know the answers. And what I took away from that was, it's okay not to know. You know, at the end of the day, we're still learning all this sort of stuff. And I really love, again, I find him so genuine. I find you so genuine. But this, you know, Patrick, who spent 20 years deep in the science of this, is still going, hey, we don't know why that happens. And I, I think that's that's fantastic. So, um, but at the same time, obviously, he knows a lot and he's got a lot of books about it. Um, but yeah, I just love that, again, authenticity from his point of view, which is we're still learning these things. Mm. But yeah, no, thank you. I'm just seeing those nice comments. Well, no, great. It's a pleasure working with you. It's a pleasure um, being your friend as well. And I really, it's weird, isn't it? Because we said the other day, we actually haven't seen each other in real life yet. No. We've, uh, we've got this relationship <laughs> for a year, but we've never actually met, which is uh, weird. But yeah. One day. Let us okay. give us again about your channel. So where's, what's your YouTube channel? I'm pressing the wrong button yeah. here. Am I really technically going well here? <laughs> <laughs> Where do we subscribe um, to? Um, so so take a deep breath is the is the youtube um, i'm really trying to work on instagram at the minute it's something i've not been very good at, good at so i think we hit 600 subscribers yesterday um which is brilliant um but it, that's take a deep breath .co uk. so if you could get over to there that would be amazing um and then the only thing i don't really talk about too much but i'm going to more is we've got a hypnosis channel for stress anxiety depression and phobias and we've hit about two and a half thousand subscribers on there now um and there's about 60 to 70 videos all bespoke towards different hypnosis um, modalities. So I'm not a hypnosis person, but I am the videographer, I'm the editor. Uh, and my good friend who I spoke about earlier, Lester, he he is a qualified uh, clinical hypnotherapist and he, he, look, he runs that channel. So if you get a chance to go over to Hypnotherapy Unleashed, that might have some benefit for you as well. I think I've frozen again. I think you've frozen again. You've frozen again. It's, that's a better shot than mass freeze, I think. <laughs> you, you can use, there you go. Use, yeah. you, we can use that one as a thumbnail. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> we'll, we'll finish there because we, we've gone way over time for people. But thank you really much, so much for joining, Mike. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Really appreciate you spending your time uh, with us this, this Friday afternoon. Next week, we've got Sheila McNamara, voice coach. She's going to be chatting to me. The following week, I'm joined by Elaine Jackson and Pablo Rodriguez. We're talking about our Spanish Costa Brava adventure in, in the autumn. If anybody's interested in that, we'll also be giving away a free 30-day, not 30-day, uh, a half marathon training program. We'll be talking about half marathon training program and that as well. So on that note, is he still frozen? I'm going to leave you 
with a nice <laughs> shot of frozen Mike. Oh. Mike. <laughs> Thanks that's the longest ever. breath hold ever. That, that's yeah, yeah. Shut your mouth. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Have a brilliant time, everybody. Thanks everyone for joining, and we'll catch you all soon. And thank you so much, Mike. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. I'll just log out, log back in again. Yeah. Oh.